Great. Hi, hello, howdy everyone. My name is Chelsea A. Flowers. Um, I am the assistant curator at the Carr Center. I wanna say thank you all for being here with us today as I am in conversation with two really, really great artists that are part of the current virtual exhibition in our Carr Virtual Center. I will be in conversation with Miriam Azat and Tony Rave. Um, and so just to share some introductions a little bit about our artists, I'll start with Miriam. Um, so Miriam, uh, born in 1985, is a sculptor known for using personal belongings as the physical medium of her work, focusing on the relationship between the subconscious routine and intentional creation. Her sculptures are made by examining, proce examining processing, and arranging the um, material debris of her life and celebrating the inher inherent poetry of objects. Miriam received her MFA from Johnson State College in 2015 and is a professor of foundational design as well as a 2019 Cresby Artist Fellow. She curated the group exhibition Mid Spiritual Modern in 2019 and organized the educational showcase Mixed Nuts in Dearborn, Michigan for the Sisson Gallery at Henry Ford College in 2020. She lives and works in Detroit, Michigan. And so, hello, Miriam. Thank you for being here. Hi. Thank you for having me. Yes, thank you. Um, and so then to introduce our second artist, his name is Tony Rave. And so Tony Rave is a Detroit-based artist. Um, so artist, interdisciplinary artist, muralist, and creative, uh, whose work delves into representations of Black people in America through benevolent white uh, religious symbols. Uh, through his work, Rave creates space for critical dialogue in his community around the subject of Black anger. His practice acts as an outlet to channel rage that he and many Black men experience on a daily basis. Uh, Rave has held solo shows and has been included in group shows at various venues throughout Detroit, including uh, the solo exhibition Family Matters at Shiloh Arts in 2019, uh, the group show Useless Utility at the Museum of Contemporary Art Detroit in 2019 as well, uh, along with work currently on display um, in the Dual Vision exhibition, um, also at the Museum of Contemporary Art. Um, in 2015, Ray participated in the Red Bull Arts uh, Detroit Residency and is a co-founder of a 48-hour complex, an artist-owned space that he is helping curate and grow. So thank you, Tony, for being here with us today. Thank you. Yeah, it's nice. Um, and so, I, yeah, so I first wanted to introduce our two really great artists. Uh, they are two of four artists that are a part of the virtual exhibition the in-between that's currently on view in our Car Virtual Center. The show will be up for about another week. It'll close on June 12th. So please, if you haven't already, or if it's been a while since you've had to take a, take a look at it, go back and just have a chance to really enjoy their work. It's just really, I just, I'm very, very proud and excited and appreciative of y'all's participation in the exhibition. Um, yeah, and so just thinking about uh, the context of our talk today, it's gonna be a bit of care, a bit of kind of creation and process and storytelling and narrative or whatnot. Um, but with the idea, with the giving um, acknowledgement to process, and uh, I, I asked the two artists to give us a little bit of a virtual tour of their studio. And and so we're gonna have Miriam kind of just share her footage first. We're gonna get, really just get like a nice like, um, insight into their kind of creative process. So Miriam's gonna go first and show us a bit of what her um, studio space looks like. Hello, my name is Mariam. I am an artist and a teacher, and I live um, in Detroit, Michigan. And my studio is in my home, and we are standing in my home right now. And um, I'm gonna show you my studio and, my, and kind of give you an idea of how I organize my stuff. Um, so yeah, so I'll do that by turning the camera around. I've turned the camera around and now you're looking at a wall with kind of a bunch of nails sticking out of it. Um, this is how I work. Usually um, I'll start with a piece, something that interests me on the wall, something from my life. So like this, there, uh, hair comes from my mom. Um, hair comes from my mom. Um, <laughs> ribbon not from my mom. Um, a tortoise shell hair clip that broke, which everyone knows how hard it is to find a good one. So, you know, so these things are up here now, um, and these are being, these are on their way to being worked with. Um, and that's kind of how it moves. So there's, it's always like a, some sort of conversation that I'm having in this general area with myself. Um, and this 
you know, and this <laughs> piece is more in the round. Sometimes I do work in the round, but it is made of, you know, stuff. My old chair, the rattan sort of busted. So it was time to sort of incorporate it into something and um, sort of wall housewarming gifts and things like that, things that I've been given um, over time. So it's, you know, that's how that works. And then I have these um, epically intense lights from Home Depot. No, not Home Depot. Don't shop at Home Depot. Um, and this really good camera, which I use to um, show people what I do. And then um, this is kind of what you could call a workbench kind of area. Um, and this is like my sewing kit. Um, I used to be very, very dumb intense about my sewing kit. And now I've sort of been a little bit more relaxed as I've grown up. Um, let's see, there's also, uh, so this is sort of like a, a really dynamic wall, constantly moving, constantly changing, will look different maybe in an hour. Like it's just always a, never the same. And then I use this area over here to sort of plop things for a while that either need to be photographed or boxed or shipped or given away or whatever. Um, so it's like more of like a little staging zone. But that's really it. That's how it's organized. That's how I work. Um, yeah. So I'm gonna flip the camera around to say goodbye. Thank you for watching and goodbye. And I can't wait to talk to you more about my work. And uh, thank you. All right. Yeah, great. Yeah, so that was really delightful. We'll talk more about it in a bit. Thank you for sharing your gives a little virtual tour, Miriam. And so now Tony's going to share or gives a little bit of a virtual tour of his space. Um, hello, my camera is uh, is kind of broken, so uh, bear with me with the visual effects. Um, this is my studio, um, and uh, I'm going to show you. This is my little paint area for whenever I want to paint, do murals or anything like that. Um, and some things that I use for art. I know you see shaving cream there and a bottle of Remy, but th those are art materials. Um, it's kind of messy right now, but I'm sure y'all understand that. Um, these are some of the things that I collect for the Family Matters series. Um, this is the station for that. Um, these are some of my finished pieces, some of pieces that are, are not finished, materials that I use for um, making them beautiful. Um, I have black eyed peas that I use, glass, uh, 3D printouts, um, glass cutters that I you know, use to, cl to cut glass, um, bottles that I use, um, an old vintage Christian statues. Um, that is a lamp. And I have my crystals that I use here. And also glass, paint, things like that. These are the Jordans that I use, uh, that I'm going to use to make sculpture. These are some finished pieces here. Um, I use a bunch of glass in my work, so here are some of my glass pieces here. This is a new piece here. It's the newest piece that I have. These two together. Another piece. Um, this is the entire studio here. Um, here's a piece that I'm working on. A pig. So yeah, this area here is 
the area that I do, the theme of the family matters, the blackface, uh, Christian angels, and Jesus, and Virgin Mary. Um, so, that's it. That is my studio. Thank you. I hope the quality of video is good enough. Um, have a blessed day. Yeah, great. And so, also, thank you. Oh, no worries, you know. Camera's broken. No worries. What's technology? It's just a whole thing that makes us be connected to each other. I don't know. A tracking device. I don't know. Um, but that's a whole tangent. Um, but yeah, I just want to say thank you all once again for sharing uh, your studios. And they, once again, it's just really great to like, see the insider, just a really creative uh, materiality since y'all are um, like you're kind of like you're sculpting, you're creating. And so you're making these dimensionality type objects. And so it's just really nice to be able to see a little bit behind the scenes of what that looks like. Um, but so to kind of transition into the questions that I have for y'all, um, I really wanted to lay the foundation for this talk. Um, and so for that, I wanted to ask if you two can talk about the concepts that, are, that drive your work. Um, yeah, so really what concepts drive your work? Miriam, if you could answer that question first. What concepts are driving your work? Um, so uh, for as long as I've been working uh, three-dimensionally since um, I think, graduate school, um, a, like a good, I don't know, I'm just gonna not even like nail down a time frame, but as long as I've been working three dimensionally, it's been with my stuff because it just it sort of made sense to use all the stuff that I had because I had so much stuff. Even if it looked like I didn't have stuff, I always had stuff coming in, things that it, people give you. Um, so just the nature of objects and, and stuff like that are, are really interesting to me um, and the physicality of, of touching something and manipulating it and turning it into something else. Um, so I guess process-wise and material-wise, that's those are the, the things I'm interested in is is how, how can I make something when I didn't intentionally set out to acquire the thing that it's made of and how did that enter into my life and, and, and that type of thing. And then conceptually uh, it's very much like a like a personal journal like a diary just writing things down that I'm interested in you know depending on what I'm interested in at the time yeah thank you it's really interesting and thinking and then um, Tony you're next but as you're, I just want to acknowledge uh, Miriam's Miriam's comment this idea about kind of the, um, I'm thinking about language and how the objects are kind of a translation of this language and like what you have and kind of this personal language so I think that's super interesting. Um, but yeah, Tony, just, um, I feel like you kind of you touched on it a bit, but really what concepts are driving your work? Um, conceptually, I mean, I would say what drives this body of work here specifically is, um, rage and trying to find a place for that rage and making sense of it. Um, you know, I care a lot about um, my people and um, I, but, and I also care about my work. And I realized that I had a lot of uh, pent up anger and bitterness and things like that. Um, and I, I wanted to, I wanted to make some work that, uh, that showed that um, I think that a lot of times, um, myself personally, um, we want to just like yell out and scream sometimes, and um, and I think that we have the right to do that, you know, especially with the psychological warfare going on in the world right now. There's so much uh, to compute in our head, and there's so much going on, so much that we're that we're looking at. And it's, and it's going in our head and, and it's been going on for years. And um, so I wanted to, to kind of um, make some work that's kind of like uh, going against that psychological warfare that we've been, that we, that we've been uh, uh, waged upon. Um, meaning the, these white figures that are holy and, um, you know, they come off as innocent when it's exactly the opposite. Um, you know, me personally, my whole life, uh, 
well, not my whole life, but as a, as a child, I went to church. My mother was very religious and we would go to church and uh, we had this belief that, uh, I believe that God was white when I was a kid. You know, that's my understanding. And, uh, you know, as we get older, we realize, you know, that isn't true. And uh, so me just taking these, these figures, these white innocent figures, these holy figures and being able to layer them with something else that was created by white people or the white society, uh, which is the black face and put that on top of it. Um, it did a lot for me uh, therapeutically, you know what I mean? Uh, it did a lot for me personally. And um, I wanted to be able to create a new universe with that. So that is like the, the main uh, influence behind that um, and being able to do that and get that out so I can move beyond that because I have more things that I want to create a lot of, a lot more things uh, that have nothing to do with race or gender or, or class or anything like that and um, so I just want to I want to paint just to paint sometimes you know I want to get back to painting so that's why I'm closing this um, on Juneteenth I will be stopping this body of work stop creating this body of work just to do something different that's yeah thank you for sharing that's that's really interesting also you, you gave us a lot or gave me a lot to think about um and so i will have more questions uh later on but um something that that was really interesting is just like this subversion that you're talking about or and like this layered subversion with like um with like blackface but then also putting it on like uh biblical or iconoclastic in, uh, objects and images so then it's really interesting um yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll come back to it. And that was really great, um, super interesting. And I think also just kind of seeing comparison between like Miriam's idea about language and also kind of this idea about, and also Tony, like it's language, but also like a, a cathartic release like for like this language or for these emotions. So it's, it's I, think, I think it's really interesting kind of like parallels and like the driving force behind y'all's work. Um, it's in my brain, that's the connection that I made. Um, but yeah, I wanted to, so just kind of sliding into the next question um, relating to the ideas about concepts. Um, I was uh, really curious um, if like the thematic focus of your work uh, changed during the pandemic. Um, like, were you exploring different themes? Um, and then if so, do you think any of these, um, were, was any of this exploration attributed to having to quarantine or yeah, to having to quarantine? And so I'm gonna start with you, Tony. Um, did any of like, your themes change during the pandemic? Um, I would just say um, it, it increased my creativity, I would say. Uh, I added more things to these uh, figurines, uh, you know, like crystals, um, what else? Um, you know, just actually like building upon them, not just putting blackface on it, but just like kind of creating more of a conversation or a narrative within the piece. Um, but it, it just gave me more time to create, I would say. Um, I didn't really have any kind of, um, you know, any kind of feelings due to the pandemic other than motivation to to do more, I would say, and to develop this, this will push it a little further. Um, but, um, but yeah, when it comes to the theme of it, uh, just creating more narrative within each piece and uh, making it a whole, a whole a solid piece, you know. Um, yeah, I would say that. Okay, super quick question, then I'll get to Miriam. Um, I, did you have a moment of rest? I'm really curious, you said that like, you kind of like, just kind of kept going and kept pushing your work during this time, but Tony, did you have a moment of rest during like this wild time of 2020 and really 2021? No. Mm -hmm. No? No. All right. I have not, I have not, a, as you know, I'm doing quite a bit of things right now. I, I, I cook, um, doing my artwork, I'm building out a house, uh, full-time father. Um, so I'm just, I don't really have too much time to rest uh, um, at all. You know. All sure. right. Yeah. yeah, no, I was just really curious, at least rest within regards to your art practice. Um, 
we're going to talk about self-care later and because I love tips for care. So um, I'm hoping that we can, oh my gosh, exchange some tips or whatnot. But I mean, once again, a lot of admiration just for you as a creator and also for time management. I'm not even sure how to classify that because that's my, my day is waking up, eat, trying to eat three meals a day and then going to sleep. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, a, a lot of like respect um, for the plate that you for that full plate that you have. Um, but yeah, uh, Miriam, the uh, same question to you thinking about like thematically during the pandemic, did your, uh, did your kind of thematically, did your work change or your focus change or were exploring different things, uh, um, because of the pandemic or could you to quarantine? Um, a little bit, things kind of got, um, oh, well, I'm, I live by myself, so I was very like super isolated and I was teaching, but it was all remote. And I, you know, was very, I'm very much an introvert anyway, and to myself anyway. So honestly, with respect to like the actual studio setup, no, but the conditions like mentally and psychologically really shifted. And I think that I maybe changed a little bit in how um, strict I was with myself in the studio with certain rules that I had made up between me and myself in terms of what it is to make something or make an object or deal with an object or deal with material, whatever. Um, I think that sort of loosened up because of the fact that everything else was so tight. So it was sort of like more of a release. So in respect, it's very similar, I think, to Tony and the fact that I feel like I was more creative and maybe that was like, we got to it in a different way, but like it was like the same. Kind of result, I guess. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you for sharing. And a super quick follow-up question for you, Miriam, is you mentioned so like kind of the rules that you have when you're creating. Can you share what some of the rules are, if you don't mind? Oh, like I used to be like really like a stickler for what could and could not be incorporated into like a piece of work. Like I was like, no plastics, no like, bleh. like it doesn't have to be like real like vintage materials. And I've actually gotten into. Um, photographing materials and actually using digital prints of the actual material in the, in the piece. So it's like 2D and 3D now, and it has nothing to do with the materiality, but more the sentiment of the actual object. So yeah, I guess that's like a, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Example. Sorry, excuse me. Bless you. Um, oh. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, well, yeah, thank you. Okay, so I was really curious. So thank you for sharing more insight into like, I think it's also really interesting, this idea about like, kind of rules that um, creatives or artists like put on themselves when it comes to making. But yeah, yeah. thank you for sharing that. Yeah, totally. um, yeah. So yeah, let's, we're gonna keep on chugging down this track. <laughs> um, so my next question for y'all, um, and then is, and so kind of diving a bit more into like work and then also materials or whatnot and also narratives behind your work. Um, so when I look at both of your work, I think a lot about the materials and then how they influence like the stories as the narr slash the narrative that you're telling in your work. Um, what I find interesting is how you both work in like this really like, interdisciplinary way. And so can you speak to the importance of like the me like, medium material and then how these like influence or affect that story that you're trying to tell? And then Miriam, if you'd like to go first with this one? Um, I think that the, so usually when I start something, it's because something that I have owned is um, being exiled from my life in terms of like being used in a daily way or something like that, or it's broken or something like that. So usually there is a very, there's a clear seed thought that goes along with an object if I start building it. Um, and that comes strictly from the material itself. However, there's, definitely research and different um, different moments that sort of, I think, involve a little bit more growth for me as an artist. And these are really good moments. All right. Oh, I think we might have lost Miriam for a moment and we'll give her a chance to come on back. Um, but so while we're waiting for Miriam to join us back in, Tony, uh, the same question for you. Oh, 
Mary just came back. Howdy. Hello. Howdy. We lost Where you for I, a moment. Where did I leave you? I don't know. <laughs> I cannot ex exactly tell you. Um, uh, something about not intimacy. How about you just take it from the top and then we'll hear even more great things about it. What was the question? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. There is, you know, once again, the internet. We're just here for it. We're yeah, just no, here for it. Yeah, I'm absolutely. Sorry. There's no worries at all. No worries at all. Um, I, think I, had just, I think I had just said that the materials basically are holding something in them anyway that I use mm. because they're just to my stuff. Got it. Got it. Okay. So, okay. So the materials in and of themselves, since they're personal to you, they're telling their own story. And I'm worried I might have lost, might then, have lost um, her. Sometimes I'll have something that is. <laughs> we can hear you. Oh yeah, please, please continue. Sometimes you might. You can hear me? Oh no. I can hear you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, we can? can hear you. Yes. yes. Okay. Well, the, the things I make the stuff out of are mine. Okay, Tony, to you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so could you uh, ask me the question? I remember the question, but I would rather have a fresh question. Sure, of course, of course. Yeah, I mean, some more or less. Um, so I'm looking at your work, um, thinking about how there's so much, that, so that materials are such a large part um, in your work. And so um, I'm just, if you could talk a bit about how, um, how the materials influence the story session narrative that you're telling within your work. Um, and so just kind of speaking to the importance of like the medium, the material, and how they influence or affect the story that you're trying to tell within the work. Okay. So this is a great question because um, I am getting to the point with my work, with this particular body of work, that I am increasing the value of my materials. So when I first started, I would go to the Salvation Army and just get some random uh, angels or the Virgin Mary or Jesus or whatever. Uh, and after doing this for so long and you know, talking to. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. OK. Um, after talking to uh, some of my peers and uh, people like that, uh, other artists, uh, I am getting, you know, just better materials. So I'm getting more vintage, um, vintage sculptures and things like that, things that actually have value. So, which means that I have to go to specific places to get them. So antique shops, um, estate sales, things like that. And I am increasing my knowledge of these sculptures that I'm buying and these figurines and things like that. Uh, you know, for example, I think the furthest I, I went was um, Ohio, Cleveland to get a few pieces, which was worth it. Um, and the better the materials, the more expensive for sure. Um, I like to get pieces that are valuable to um, collectors and things like that to that are old old pieces that are maybe a hundred years old or more to be able to desecrate them. And that makes my, my piece that much more stronger uh, in many ways, because there's someone out there who really likes that piece and I'm just desecrating it. You know what I mean? To tell a better story. Um, so no matter, no matter what, no matter how, how old or valuable, these pieces are, I'm trying to get the most valuable ones. So that way I can destroy them. Um, and so, yeah, the materials for me uh, is everything. Even the, the crystals that I'm using, I'm not using rhinestones or anything like that. I'm using Swarovski crystals, um, things that have value. Uh, I'm using alcohol in them, um, whole bottles of cognac and things like that, um, glass, broken glass, and things like that. So um, yeah, the, 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 the getting of the materials, the gathering of the materials has been um, fun because I've been you know, searching all over the place for certain uh, sculptures or statues that may 
already tell a story and then I can add to that story and create a whole nother story with that, with those pieces, depending on the gestures of, uh, um, the bodies that are that are in that piece, you know, the the Virgin Mary, she may be holding Jesus, and um, you know, the cherubs that I have that I use, um, you know, they could be sleeping cherubs or playful cherubs. Um, you know, for example, the ones that I have at a uh, at MoCAD, I'm using Jordans um, and things like that, and those are expensive as well. I get those donated sometimes. But using the, the Jordans and the materials that, um, you know, just kind of like talking about materialism as well in my pieces as well. So, yeah, that, that's everything. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, I did want to circle back around to Miriam in one moment, but um, Tony, and I know I mentioned this to you before, but I think if you haven't had a chance to, you should definitely check out the Museum of Racist Paraphernalia. It's at Ferris State University. Um, wait, have you already been? Did we already have this? I haven't, I haven't okay. I, but I plan to go there for sure. Yeah, it's, it's sorry? Yeah, I was saying I need to go there for sure. Yeah, I think and for people who are not familiar with it, it's more or less, it's um, this curator basically started this collection of objects that are in its title that are just, you know, racist. Um, and so the, they have such a, like an in-depth uh, collection of like salt shakers and just like um, like yard signs and to like more modern day things of like Barack Obama objects, which is just like, and like yeah. they have games and like they like show like kind of, cartoons and kind of this like whole history and so it's just this really like somewhat intense experience but um and so yeah so i think that you would get a lot out of um and also just maybe being able to like um engage with the with the collection in and of itself sorry and as you were speaking i was thinking about the work of uh mining the museum oh my gosh um i'm so sorry that i'm blanking on his name but it's a really great project mining the museum donald if someone remembers the name, please feel free to throw it in the chat. I cannot recollect what his last name is. Um, Wilson. Wilson. Let me know if I'm wrong. I want to, that, I'm Fred Wilson. Fred Wilson. There we go. Fred Wilson's work on mining the museum. There we go. Thank you. Took me a minute, but I got there. Um, and so just in thinking about these objects and kind of like retelling this narrative. Um, so then it's kind of something that's super interesting. I see those parallels between your work and then um, or what you're doing within the Family Matters work and then also like his work. And then one last question before I go back to Miriam. Um, Tony, do you ever, I think it's really interesting hearing you talk about like the, I believe the search, the search for these objects and this idea and how this attention to like, the quality of the material. Do you ever um, like see like this search as like a performance or do you ever kind of record them as performances? Like, like say you mentioned how you went to Cleveland or kind of how you're going to the state sales. Do you ever see that as like a performance? Um, I have I have never done that. I mean, that's a good good way to look at it. I mean, um, it's no, I d I've never thought about that. Um, but my experience uh, searching for them is very um, it's fun. I would say uh, I, I like to search through them uh, and find the value in them. Some are not valuable at, at all. Um, um, but that's it. I've never thought about it that way. No, I've never thought about that. But yeah. Yes, it is a performance. Yeah, I mean, I think it is in of its sense. And I was just super curious and like in my brain and thinking about performance, how like the kind of like the final product is like the resolution of a performance of like going and searching for these things or or it could be or it could be viewed in that sense. Um, but I think yeah. just the idea of the act of the search is really interesting. Yeah, I see it as like offensive offensive art in a way like in a, in a way like rage art an offensive art because I'm, I'm kind of going at the oppressor in a way um and kind of um, just like i said like desecrating their holy image and try and continuing to do it i mean um i don't think i'm ever going to stop uh but i cause I, I don't think i'm ever going to stop collecting them and, and trying to desecrate them. I may show them at a later date or something like that. But, you know, as 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 I go on throughout life, I, I, I will acquire more um, ones that are the most valuable. Um, 
you know, I have I have plans for sure. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Just I was just very very curious. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then one thing for Miriam, um, super quickly, as you're speaking with this idea about kind of your studio and um, and just kind of like how like you have these objects and kind of how there's some objects that were originally not like intended to be artwork. I was thinking of this Chicago-based artist who whose father was an artist, and so she acquired his studio space. Um, and so more or less, it was just like full of these objects. And so she had like these kind of really like intimate um, experiences or kind of relationships with these objects. Um, do we, are you still there, Miriam? I'm, st I'm still here. I, okay, I can hear you both great. very, very clearly. Can you hear me? We can now, yes. I was worried that we lost you for a moment. I just can't. Um, I just can't see. I'm I'm frozen on the screen in a very a very flattering face. I'm making a very flattering face. <laughs> I can't. Um, but I can hear you, so I can keep talking. I can. I heard. Okay. I hear everything. <laughs> All right, great. Just wanted to make sure. Um, but can you yeah, see I mean, me? it's more. Yeah, or I can see you on this end. Yes. Um, okay. Cool. But just to wrap up the tangent that I was on, more or less. Um, anyway, so I was just really curious about like the objects in which you would acquire and kind of relating it to the Chicago based artist who like she just has the space she's just full of these objects. And so like it's acknowledgement to like like lineage, it's, it's acknowledgement to kind of like familial like um, kind of connections. And so I was wondering, so I think you kind of started to briefly talk about it, but if you could speak more and even like in your virtual uh, studio um, tour, there's acknowledgement to like kind of like hair clips and kind of some things that were yours and then there's like a February 21 yeah. kind of like hair elastic. And so, yeah, if you could just take a bit more to kind of these like familial kind of connections of things. Yeah, well, I mean, we have, I, so um, my, okay, I, I guess it, on a psychological level, um, uh, my mother is an immigrant and is, uh, maybe would be offended if I use the word hoarder, but, I might use the word hoarder in this small space without just us. And um, I really have a difficult time stacking things and keeping things like in a sort of a collection in that sense, unless I'm very uh, sort of, I, I have to sort of use the things that are around me. They have to have some sort of purpose. So. That's why I don't exactly entirely throw things away. I sort of repurpose them into my artwork, I think. And so like a lot of my stuff that my mother has given me or a lot of stuff that people have given me as gifts, if something breaks or if something is just, there's no space for it, I'll just turn it into something else in that way. Yeah, I think that's super interesting. Um, and I mean, also I, I love like the idea of like, just the repurposing and actually kind of, it's like a kind of a nice like kind of comment to transition into the next question, but I do love like the repurposing um, and just kind of always like finding um, like a new life for this object to have for a lack of better words, um, the ontological <laughs> perspective of an object. Um, but yeah, so for our next question, um, and so yeah, it's kind of really building off the idea of like the materiality, kind of the creation process, um, and then maybe we kind of already did touch on it, but maybe we'll have y'all touch a bit more on it. But if you could speak to the idea of like collage slash abstraction, and so really looking at both of your works, like I think about like the collaging of the materials and the collaging of the narratives that you're kind of creating with these materials. Um, and so can you speak to how like you combine and form these like, these like physical kind of materials, um, but then also how you're combining like these like metaphorical like stories in your work? And then also, Tony, if you wouldn't mind going first, I can also repeat it if you would like me to. Oh, sorry, Tony, we cannot hear you. I apologize. Uh, when I first started, I was using a Sharpie to create the black face on there. You know what I mean? Because uh, it was just a, it was installation. I was just thinking of it as just an installation, not selling these pieces. I was not selling them for a while because I didn't know how I felt about selling these pieces to the public. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't sell them for, I, I believe, the entire year after the Shiloh Arts installation. 
And then uh, I realized that um, I came to the conclusion that it's okay to do it, you know? And I started off picking people who I would sell them to. And now it's just open to sell to everyone uh, because I'm, I'm at peace with it now. I understand what it is. Um, but as it grew, uh, I was, so I started off and it was just Sharpie and like fingernail, fingernail polish, red fingernail polish. Uh, that's what that was at first. And then I went to just better paints like car paint, you know what I mean? Like one shot uh, enamel paint. Um, it's increasing the value, the, the, va the value of the materials. Um, and then I started to break them up, tearing off wings and stuff like that. If, if they, if the angels weren't valuable, if I just got them from the Salvation Army for 50 cents or something like that, I would tear off the wings and I would throw the, the rest out um, to um, combine them with other things. So taking out these these uh, t these valuable um, pieces off off of the these pieces that are, aren't really valuable. So the wings, um, some of the hands and things like that. Um, the heads of them certain times, you know, and then using resin to put them together to make that story. Um, you know, first I was, like I said, I was really insecure about selling them because all I'm, all I'm simply doing is layering the, the uh, black face on top of something that's already created. So I didn't really see the individual pieces as art, as me selling these, you know, as an art piece. Uh, but just doing it for so long, um, I was able to create actual pieces out of every single one of them. Um, so yeah. So. Yeah, thank you. That's, I think it's super interesting also kind of sharing the, um, not like the lineage, but kind of like the history of, it's of like the creation, because um, I didn't realize that in the earliest stages that it was like Sharpie and you said fingernail polish. So that's super interesting. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, and so Miriam, um, same question, just if you could talk about the idea of kind of like collage and abstraction and um, thinking about how like the collaging of the materials, like so you're physically kind of collaging and creating, but so like the physical work, but then also like the metaphorical like piece that's also of you like kind of collaging those materials, if you could speak to that. Oh, oh no, did we lose you again? Oh. Sounds like it. Fortunately, having some technical difficulties on Miriam's end, but hopefully she'll be back with us soon. We'll give her a moment. Um, but while we are giving Miriam her moment, we'll circle back around to that question. Definitely want to hear her perspective on the collaging of like the materials and then the narratives within the work. Um, Tony, I'm going to ask you the last question and hopefully by the time you're done responding, Gary will be back with us. Um, so at the beginning or towards the beginning of our talk, I just mentioned ideas about self-care and how I'm always open for tips. Um, I should do more than just uh, eat three meals a day. <laughs> um, and so I was really curious about how you're taking care of yourself during this time. You mentioned that you're super busy, but like, um, you know, how are you taking care of yourself? Have your ideas of care changed during this past year? Um, and also as far as care, like what are you consuming? Is it TV? Is it podcasts? Is it books? Like what are you consuming to like to care for yourself? Also, sorry, you're muted. Uh, I'm currently uh, trying to get up as early as possible. Um, I mean, like six, sometimes five uh, to get up and work out and get that out of the way. Uh, and get a good meal because I usually am getting up and, um, you know, getting my children ready for school, uh, online school, and I need to be up before them. Um, and I need to already have my workout done and have them ready to get up and eat, feed them, and then start working on the house. So, you know, start to uh, build out this house and also make time for the studio to create uh, my children usually come with me 
to the studio and to the house sometimes. We have a big backyard, so they play out in the backyard while I'm working on the house. Um, so, and when it comes to eating, um, I'm eating everything except for pork right now. So, uh, because I, uh, I'm trying to just maintain good weight, um, but then eventually I want to not eat any, any meat at all. Um, I would like to be a vegetarian all the time, but right now I'm kind of, I don't have the time to think about what I eat right now. Um, cause I really just need to, uh, I'm trying to do that snap, wake up, wake up in the morning and go. And you know, that's where I'm, that's where I'm at. I usually get about five to six hours of sleep. Um, and then occasionally I'll take a nap, things like that. But, um, and when it comes to podcasts or anything like that, I don't really, I listen to music. I play music all throughout the day for my children, for myself. Um, and uh, I cook cookbooks, things like that. Um, I'm really on feeding myself and my community. I want to nourish the my artist friends. Um, and speaking of that, I have a Juneteenth pop-up dinner coming up. I'm feeding 20 artists for free, 20 black artists or 20 um, black people in the art world. So curators, artists, um, and I'm feeding them for free. And it's all vegan, gluten-free and nut-free food. Uh, I will be putting the flyer out soon. And that's gonna be the finale of the Family Matters series. So I wanna honor these artists and give them some type of uh, great meal and detox at the same time. Oh, that sounds really great. Um, yeah. well, and you're, I you're invited. You're invited. Oh, I mean, I assumed. I was just gonna yeah. like, like let me know. Like I already know the address. Um, <laughs> So yeah. also the, the nut free, I really appreciate because I have so many allergies. And so I think it's just funny, the whole like, how do you treat yourself well? <laughs> or, or what are you consuming? How do you like food? Um, I used to get hospitalized all the time just because of nut allergies. It was just wild. Um, well, this is perfect yeah. for you. I really appreciate it. I really do. So I'll, I'll see you, uh, you know, at, two weeks. At, at Anthology. <laughs> okay. Anthology oh. Coffee and Easter Market. Got it. So not at the house. All right. Here we are. Here we are. Good to know. Good to know. All right. Sounds great. Thank you. Um, and so it seems like Miriam still hasn't rejoined us, but also since you mentioned the house a few times, do you want to just talk a bit more about what that project is? And then we'll take some questions that are in the chat. But mm -hmm. yeah, I do you want to talk more about that project. So the project is the 48 hour. Um, it's the 48 hour experience. We've been doing this for about three to four years. Um, it slowed down a little bit because of uh, what's been going on in the world and things like that. And me having so many things going on, but we acquired a house in Highland Park and it has a, a large amount of land around it. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're creating a space for artists to have resources and uh, be able to thrive uh, through us and just you know get those resources through us. Um, whether it be they need a place to stay um, or a place to work on a project, uh, a project. Um, so that's uh, what I'm creating right now. Um, I'm actually building it out currently. Uh, I think that it will be livable in about another three to four months. So that will be activation in about three to four months. Um, this is a kind of a radical um, perspective on a residency or a hub for artists uh, because I, I'm specifically targeting artists who are maybe misunderstood or underdeveloped um, artists who just need help maybe on a particular body of work and they're like hey I just need this space for two months and I need like two people to help me will be a space for that depending on uh, you know how we're sold on that particular body of work that that artist is trying to uh, tell us about. Um, that we want to be a, a political source too, a, 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 politi a political, um, artistic, political collective. 
where uh, we can get together to talk about what is going on politically around us and what we can do to affect that. Um, so that'll be kind of generally what that uh, 48 hour complex is. Uh, the 48 hour is a 48 hour artist retreat pretty much where artists, about nine artists get together. They focus on one body of work for those 48 hours nonstop. If they want to take a nap, they can, but it uh, it's ongoing for 48 hours. And then after the 48 hours, we show their work. Yeah, I agree. Thank you for sharing. So that sounds like a really like the like great kind of a uh, like resource or kind of cultural center, um, which I feel like we can always uh, use those. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, great. And then also, Miriam, welcome back. <laughs> so um, sorry. Yeah, no, once again, here. no worries. The internet, it's, it's a place that we are living on right now. Um, also kind of perfect timing. Um, I honestly forget what question we were on. Um, I, I was panicking uh, for the last like, 10 minutes. No, there's no worries at all. Um, but actually, I know that I want to, there are some questions, there are some comments um, from the audience. So I just want to ask you one quick question then to get to the questions that are in the chat. Um, but I just wanted to know how you're taking care of yourself. Tony just shared that he's going to be feeding artists, um, like, you know, sharing what he does, what he does before he like, you know, working out, like eating well and whatnot. So I'm just really curious, like, how are you taking care of yourself during this time? Even though the world's opening up just a, like a bit, it feels a little bit too fast to me. That's just my stance. But um, yeah, how have you been taking your care of yourself? How have you been taking care of yourself in this time? What have you been consuming? Um, yeah. What's your, what are your ideas of care? Well, definitely eating really well and um, eating produce is really great, especially since we still have access to nice produce nearby. Um, and so eating really well and um, obviously drinking water. Uh, but as far as like self care, I think it was a real, I have to make a real um, effort to see people and really schedule in like, you know, meeting up with like a friend or something like that and having um, some social something um, because there's not, I think, I think it's, I think it's really hard to really um, assess how much we have really lost in terms of our social connection. Um, I think we do really great on the internet uh, maybe not for maybe not my last performance just yet, but like um, it's nice, but it's obviously no uh, replacement for the real thing. And it's weird, just the nuances of social um, social engagements and social interaction in person is like so much more amplified right now. I feel, um, but I agree with you. I think we're a little too soon to jump the gun here and. <laughs> and get out there and make like, um, it's opening up a little quickly, I feel, but. Yeah, that's, that's a whole tangent that uh, we don't have time for that I could go on. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, well, thank you. I want to say thank you all for like, sh answering the question, sharing your perspectives. Um, there are a few questions in the chat that I wanted to address. Um, and so, let's see, thank you. Yeah, so Sarah says, uh, Tony, such a great series. Uh, thank you for it. Uh, did the series help you access the emotional resolution that you're seeking? Oh, you're muted. I was saying that's a great question, and I appreciate her for asking that. Um, I would say I'm on my way for sure. Um, I think that I'm. A, I think that I'm a ta talented artist technically when it comes to like different things that I know how to do and I would like to flourish in those ways. Um, I think, you know, this, it, it was a weight on me for sure, and I'm happy to get it off. Um, that's why I put it in episodes and I put it in a, um, a season. So this is a season that is closing up. I did about four to five uh, different episodes, maybe six episodes of this, and uh, I am closing it up on Juneteenth with this dinner for these black artists that I'm honoring. Um, so this is this is very deep for me because I, I don't wanna feel angry all the time. I don't wanna feel rage. 
Um, and, you know, they're going to continue to put things on TV with black bodies dying and things like that, you know, and, you know, that's part of it. You know, when, when you, when you continue to see yourself dying on TV all the time and it's so normalized, it is, it's going to do a lot to us as a whole. And, um, so that I'm sure I'm, I'm dealing with that because I, I feel like I care a lot and I want to find a way for me to do something about it. And it's not, that's not just someone buying our piece from me and it's and just putting it on there in their living room. Like I want to do something about it. I have a plan. I can't really disclose that right now. Uh, you'll find out in the next, uh, season of family matters. Um, but yes, I am putting it to us to the side on Juneteenth so that way I can just paint and feel better. I'm sure that I'll feel something. Um, but I feel like I have this, I have, like, I have to do this. I have to um, do this body of work and evolve it. You know, you know, it's season two, you will see the evolution of it. Um, you know, but yeah, I, I do feel a little better and I, and things, me uh, continuously t developing this body of work has developed myself. I can see things a little clearer. Um, it makes me feel good to, to splash paint on uh, these false icons, these false uh, gods or these false holy figures. Um, and, and you know, hopefully it helps other people too. But the goal is to translate these into creating statues of black people, of uh, uh, people who aren't here with us anymore, maybe some people who are here. So uh, I guess I disclose that, but I, I want to achieve uh, making sculptures of um, people that I, that I like, people that, you know, black people, black bodies that are living and who aren't here anymore and have them be be made and we will find out where they will be placed later so for example i feel that me us three uh with the power that we have we can make a statue of coleman young we can make it happen and we continue to put our talents sometimes on the back burner, not thinking that we're that much power. We're, we're very powerful. Like we are the makers along with our network. Uh, Miriam, I'm sure you probably have a great network of sculptors and people in, in, you know, in, um, in your world that you can combine with Chelsea, that can combine with mine, that we can get our community to put that money up to make that Coleman Young statue. And I'm, we can put it in my backyard until we find a spot downtown to put it. Uh, so I think as artists, we, we just have to make more and, and push harder uh, instead of just being solo and isolated and trying to get the next artist opportunity and waiting for that next grant or that next opportunity to to make something with, you know what I mean? Find someone to buy our, you know, $2,000, $3,000, $10,000 piece, and then we got money and then we can go buy food. I think we just need to make something that's more um lasting that's going to last when we're not here to influence uh actual change you know what i'm saying like psychological change because we're already dealing with uh the psychological warfare waged on us so we kind of need to push back as artists and and uh link up together uh and create something that's uh um uh, you know, as God says, says uh, they said in the Bible or whatever, um, what is it about uh, we were made in the image of God? We were made uh, in his image. Yeah. So, God. I mean, you know, let's let's uh, make some more positive uh, images. And, you know, those, sculpt those sculptures are going to last longer than we do. You know what I mean? I mean, they... I mean, the only one we have really that is nice is the one of... Um, what is it, the one at the former Cobo Hall, Joe Lewis? You know, that's powerful, but it's inside. It's inside mm -hmm. of a, somewhere. It's not outside for the world to see. Mm -hmm. So 
that that's my that's my goal for season two is to uh, start off this uh, and get this sculpture made. Okay, I just have two comments, and then there's one other uh, comment from the audience uh, for um, Miriam. Um, I just want to say, uh, yeah, uh, thank you for the question, Sarah. Thank you for answering, Tony. Um, and it's also also thinking about um, Tony. I think if uh, the Black Liberation Center, I think as far as like feeling rage and kind of like ways until like kind of release it, it's a really, really great resource that was started by uh, a black curator who's currently based in Cleveland. Um, so I just, I would, I'll, I'll send you the link. It's, a, it's really actually, a, I was not feeling well. And then I attended one of their, like a few of their sessions and a little bit better now. But um, yeah, I think it's a really great resource, the Black Liberation Center, just to reiterate. Also thinking about a location for the the statue or for the sculpture, I think it's just go right next to the cause, uh, K-A-W-S uh, sculpture. And that's not shade. I just think that's where it should go. Look, look, we can get a black cause, but we can't get a black statue, a black actual <laughs> person. You feel what I'm saying? Right in yeah. the middle? <laughs> yeah, or I think like that could be a whole other tangent, but just about, <laughs> we'll discuss we'll discuss it offline, new episode three, yeah, sounds yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, and then, yeah, so for our last question is for Miriam, and so Sarah also says, Miriam, love the intimacy of your pieces. Um, one of uh, one of your CVC, the so Car Virtual Center pieces, includes a very interesting background sign. Uh, what is the language used in the sign, and what does it say? Oh, so um, I think she's referring to he who fears his creator, which is <laughs> a, um, that's actually what I was talking about. I So my sister had this really intense sweatshirt that she requested be made for her when she was in high school um, that said, he who fears his creator truly fears nothing else. And it's written in like old English. Um, and my mom is the one who made it for her with puppy paint. And I find this sweatshirt to be incredible because she wore it like all the time. And she's like a very devout Muslim and like really sort of intense. And I had the sweatshirt for a while, so I'd taken a, like a closer photograph of the, the text and then used it in the background of that piece. Um, so that's kind of like a, an example of like sort of the materiality and then like what, what actually am I pulling out of this thing? What is it that I'm mostly interested in? So that was sort of um, where that came from. And it is it does look like a very strange language, but it's like old English. It's my mom's puppy paint old English. <laughs> That's really funny. Puffy paint. Love to hear it. <laughs> it's very like 2005 aesthetic. Um, but yeah, I mean, so we're at our time, but I wanted to give anyone in the audience that they want to ask one more question before we go. I could keep talking for a while, but I want to start y'all's y'all time, but I'll give a moment if there's any last questions from people in the audience. All right, we will do. Well, once again, I wanna say thank you to Miriam. Thank you to Tony for your time, for talking with me. Just really, really great. Really enjoyed your perspectives with when it came to like seeing your studio, when it came to creation and just like the stories and really how you've been creating during this time that is um, a pandemic. <laughs> um, yeah, and so just before we say goodbye to everyone, I just wanted to share a reminder that the exhibition, The In-Between, closes on June 12th. It is on view in the Car Virtual Center. Please feel free to go and check it out to enjoy it or just to revisit and seeing, um, maybe you'll see something new as you're looking at their works once again. Um, also, we have more programs coming up in, the, in June and July. Um, another exhibition will open the Car Virtual Center on June 18th, and we'll have a student show opening on June 25th in our Car Virtual Center. Um, so once again, thank you all so much for tuning in and thank you to Tony and to Miriam for your time and for talking with me. Um, enjoy. Have a lovely day. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Bye.